So, so we have Carl here to talk about his book. Um, Carl is an associate professor at Georgia Tech, um, where he has appointments in the School of Interactive Computing and the School of Literature, Media, and Communication, and directs the Experimental Civic Studio. Um, and and he has published uh, this is I think his second book um, mm -hmm. after Adversarial Design, which was his first. Um, and Design is Democratic Inquiry, as I say, just came out I think last month. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll have Carl to tell us more about that. Um, and we've also assembled a couple of other people to, to be in conversation with Carl. Um, Leah Horgan is a postdoctoral scholar in sociology and anthropology at Northeastern. They have a background in design and their work draws upon and contributes to a variety of disciplines, including science and technology studies, cultural geography, participatory ethnography, critical data studies, queer theory, and narrative media. Uh, Leah is very skilled in many different areas. Um, and then our other panelist is Lily Rani. Lily is an associate professor in communication and science studies at University of California, San Diego, um, and also serves as faculty in the design lab, the Institute for Practical Ethics, the program in critical gender studies. Um, and she also sits on the academic advisory board of the AI Now Institute, which is based at NYU. Um, her work is also characterized by a strong commitment to community engagement, which makes, it, makes her, her an especially relevant people, person to be part of this conversation. Um, and so I, the, the way we're going to do this is I asked Carl to start off by just giving us, um, talking us through the, the, the book project, maybe where some of the, the parts come from and what he, where he would like them to go, where he, who he's ho hoping to talk to. Um, I'm just saying all this now, although I didn't say that to Carl before. <laughs> I told him we'd like him to talk us through, through the book, but I didn't, I didn't put particular parameters on that. So we, he may do something quite different. And I'm not gonna, that's not gonna go on for too long, I don't think, 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll make it more of a conversation um, with our other panelists. And so if members of the audience would like to, uh, you can use the Q&A feature in the um, Zoom webinar uh, interface to, to make contributions. And I will, as sort of moderator, I will feed those, feed those questions into the, the conversation as, they, as it moves forward and as it seems appropriate. Um, so, so you don't have other features for, for asking questions other than that Q&A, and I'll try and keep an eye on that. Um, Okay, Carl, it's all down to you. Great, so um, I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna share for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. I'm gonna make a timer. Um, but first of all, I wanna say thank you. It, it's great to get to speak to this community. I'm actually always, um, or often reminded of all of the great scholarship that's coming out of UCI. I got to see uh, Dr. Crooks present yesterday and it was just amazing. Um, and inspiring work. So I'm I'm very happy to get to to get to share with you all today, and to all the folks who are coming from further afield. So I'm going to um, now share my screen, right? Which is always the tricky part. And um, I'm going to I'm going to talk, and, and what I'm going to do is um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about why I wrote this book, um, and only in passing talk about um, sort of the the specifics of it. But I think this, the, the discussion of why is important. Um, so really, like at its core, the, the question that I am was and, and, and I'm interested in is, so how might we think and do design otherwise? And, and what I mean by this is, is recognizing the capacities that design has as a structured and particular way of making in the world, um, but then also acknowledging and appreciating the limitations of design, right? And, and the ways in which um, we need to rethink um, what design is and, and contribute to um, other sorts of practices. So of course, I'm not the only one involved in this and it's crucial um, to me and all of my work to recognize that, that I see this as part of a conversation that many people are having, some of whom are coming from within um, a history of design studies, um, and some of whom are coming at this question from other perspectives, um, but bringing exciting and important work to this, this idea of how might we think and do design otherwise. Even more specifically, the question that I'm interested in is how do we think about design as a way of contributing to democracy? And in this sense, I really see this work as um, fitting within a, a history of participatory design and with 
or with a move in participatory design that's really been developing over the past several decades. So it's worth pointing out that, you know, the tradition of participatory design, at least the tradition that I'm drawing on, starts in the 1960s in Scandinavia. And at the time, that tradition is radical, right? That tradition is grounded in Marxism and feminism and um, theories of, of work around empowerment, such as the work of Paulo Freire. And it really asks this question uh, within workers, which is how can workers um, have democracy in the workplace? How can workers um, be involved in the design of the systems that are going to um, shape their labor. And one way to understand the changing character of participatory design is that it's shifting from thinking about you know, workplace democracy to asking the question, what is the work of democracy? And in answering that question, realizing that that work of democracy um, takes place, yes, in governments, but also um, in communities, right, in activist organizations, um, and, then, and then working to try to support right, those who are trying to pursue that work of democracy. Right? And again, this is something that there are many others um, who are also asking these questions. Um, one of the things that I find I have to remind people of, and really comes down to a, a key thing in the book, is that um, we have this, this way of conflating um, capitalism and democracy, particularly in design discourse. And one of the primary audiences for this book um, is those folks who, who are designers or scholars of design. And many design historians have pointed out that the origins of design as we commonly know it are in the industrial revolution, right? Design is sort of brought forth in order to serve capitalism. And this continues today, right? Even in conversations around sort of design and government or design and democracy, we see this constant return um, to the market and to a particular kind of market, right? Uh, free market capitalism as the orienting model for what design is. We could talk about um, capitalism and markets more generally. I'm actually not that interested in, in having that conversation per se, but what's important I think to recognize and what I'm trying to argue is that these are two different things, right? And so just as, for example, we wouldn't ask a typographer to use a letterpress to design a chair, like it's ridiculous to think that the theories and methods and practices developed for capitalism would translate directly to democracy, right? These are two different things and they should be treated as such. But oftentimes they're not. And so the problem is, is that even with the best of intentions, right, designers end up oftentimes working against democracy. So Lily calls this out in her book. And I will say that there were many times in one of the drafts of the book where um, um, Lily's work in Chasing Innovation haunted me um, because I think that there are, what that book does in an in a, in a amazing way is show us how um, we can try to be working towards something and yet stumble, um, not because of any sort of personal flaw, let's say, but because the methods and theories that we draw upon as designers aren't suited for this work, right? And so in many ways, what ends up happening is that design actually does what Lily says, foreclosing the slow work of democracy is difference. And my interest is, how can we not do that, right? And what I would argue is that if we want to do that, what we actually need to do is we need different narratives and theories of design. And what I'm hoping to do in this book is to begin to provide some of those narratives and theories to tell some of those stories and to tell them differently that allow us to hold on to a practice of design, but also to find different kinds of grounds for it and different ways of conveying what it is we do that don't constantly have us returning to these frames and these theories and these methods that are grounded in capitalism. So I offer this phrase, design experiments and civics is one way of capturing this. Um, this is a twist on a phrase that uh, others um, talk about democratic design experiments. And these design experiments and civics, the way I explain them is that they're design experiments because they involve making. And I think that making is, is essential to what it is that we call design. 
They're experiments not because they try to be scientific. In fact, I want to eschew that idea. Instead, it's recognizing that experimentation, inquiry, practices of inquiry occur just as much in the arts as they do as in the sciences. And so they are experiments because they're practices of inquiry that are meant to contribute to our knowing and then that way contribute to the possibilities for doing in the world. And I use the phrase civics because this is to me about democracy in the small. So my own perspective as an as a, as a activist and a scholar is in working with those communities that I am a part of or that are adjacent to me. So yes, we can have these conversations, for example, at the scale of the United Nations or at the scale of the federal government. Um, um, that's not my interest. My interest is in this idea of civics as a kind of intimate democracy, because that's actually the kind of scholarship that and activism that I want to be engaged in. Right? So when I talk about democracy, um, there are many theories, right? and we could spend the entire hour talking about different theories of democracy. For me, what's important is recognizing democracy not as a set of structures or processes. So this isn't about Congress. This isn't about um, mechanisms such as voting. This is about the idea of democracy as a lived communal experience. And in the book, I really ground that in traditions of pragmatism and in particularly um, traditions of feminist pragmatism that look at democracy as a lived communal experience. So as a lived communal experience, though, we then have to ask, what's the character of the democracy and the design that happens? And what I think is important to recognize is that democracy is fragile, it's partial, it's compromised, right? And so is the work of design. And so when we talk about design and we attempt to practice design as these things that are powerful, right? That are holistic, right? That are definitive. Right? Um, those ideas actually are in contrast with what democracy is as a lived experience. If democracy is fragile, partial, and compromised, we actually need to figure out ways of talking about and thinking about and doing design that also recognizes the way that it too is fragile, partial, and compromised. So in the book, um, what I do is I trace this through a set of projects um, with different communities and organizations. One called Parse ATL, which was done um, in collaboration um, with folks from the city that was trying to look at um, a sensor network that was proposed for the city um, as Atlanta, like many cities, was trying to become a smart city. Um, uh, another project, which is an ongoing work um, that I've been participating in for almost a decade now, maybe more than a decade, is working with a foraging collective Right, that's looking to see how do we gather um, excess fruit that's in our immediate environment and provide that fruit as sustenance for people who are in need. And then careful coding, which again is an ongoing project with um, actually one resident in particular and an organization that he has started that collects data in um, his neighborhood in order to advocate for change with city government. And then I use these to talk about sort of three themes, the themes of stories and storytelling, the idea of devices, and how devices can help us in inquiry, and then what it means or what it might mean to work with institutions in the sort of space of institutioning. And then I step back and I say, if we look across these, there's sort of two characteristics that I think are worth calling attention to. One is thinking about the design or particularly, right, the design experiment as a kind of event and what what we can appreciate about it if we see it as an event. Um, and then finally stepping back and, and making the argument that the reason to engage in this is around this idea of care and, and in particular the care for possibilities, um, those possibilities of different ways of engaging in that lived communal experience of democracy. And so that's sort of the structure of the book um, is going through these projects, drawing out these themes, and then trying to step back to, to find some um, overarching, uh, but again, um, partial um, narratives across them. So 
I want to, I'm going to end um, here, but I, I think it's, it's really important for me to recognize at the start of this that this work is not my own, right? So yes, I gathered this together and wrote the book, um, but this work has happened over a decade or more with a number of people who were on the ground right, in these organizations, um, participating in this work, um, without whom this work would not happen. And I just want to recognize that at the start. Um, so that's a little bit about why I wrote the book and a bit about what's in the book. And I thought that hopefully that will be a good starting point for the conversation. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides um, and go back to the normal view. And um, I'm looking forward to, to what we talk about for the next 45 minutes or so. Thanks, Carl. That's great. I think it gives us uh, a really good sense of the context. Um, so maybe maybe I'll throw to uh, Lily in the first instance to sort of kick us off for, with the, the sort of broader conversation. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm. I mean, we like a lot of us have been in conversation for a decade, and I remember seeing Carl. I think I. I think I met Carl in grad school. I was at a values and design workshop and he was writing the agonistic design book and kind of reading political theory and thinking about how that affects design. And I just remember thinking like, okay, yes, like political theory is really important. And, um, you know, here we are 10, 15 years later, still figuring it out. Um, I'm also honored to have been cited as haunting you. I'm sorry, uh -huh. but I'm not sorry. <laughs> I feel like someone asked me like, well, why write a book? I'll, I'll now say to be a ghost and haunt people. <laughs> or you... um, one of the things I found really powerful about this book was the focus on the possibility of design practices as these um, events that make new kinds of knowledge, relationships, and action possible. And in that sense, so uh, to be totally honest, as I was reading the book, I kind of kept thinking about you know design versus community organizing, because I've been working on projects where you know in the context of working with community organizers or even doing organizing. Um, but I kind of see this book as in some ways doing something similar to Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown. Is that a book that you've come across? Or yes, yes. Okay, yes. Like my understanding of that book is that she's trying to kind of hold space for experiments in the forms of organizing that um, can hold people together when there is difference and people are, you know, some people are trying to survive and some people are like organizing in their workplace. And, you know, how do we hold room for forms of organizing that like can, that, you know, lots of people can be in struggle together. And, um, and so in the, but so like one question I kind of had to start us off is, you know, how do you think about, how do you think about struggle or conflict, you know, kind of around this book, you know, especially given, you know, your last book was adversarial design and it was all about good democracy comes from having good enemies with that movement like cloud agonistic democracy idea. Um, so I think that struggle, at least, struggle to me is present in many points mm -hmm. in, in the book. And it's not, um, and, and that idea of, of the agonistic democracy, that idea that, 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 that we, that the characteristic of democracy is not consensus, but the ability to engage in contestation is something that I think I still hold dear and, 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 and is present. At the same time, um, you know, for me, different than the first book, the first book was really about, it was really a, a kind of classic humanities read of objects, right? Or that's the way I would describe it, where it's like, okay, I'm going to look at this object, and as a humanist, I'm going to interpret it um, using these interpretive techniques. Um, you know, throughout this book, right, we, we see this like when when the neighborhood residents collect this data and they bring this data to the city, um, you know, what they're doing, and I think this is true in, in almost any, and many cases, right, um, where we have, let's say, neighborhood organizations that are collecting data, they're using that to challenge the city, right? I mean, um, Roderick talks about this as agonistic data practices, right? This idea that, you know, the point of doing this is, 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 is not to contribute to some corpus of data, right? Suddenly we have more data about Atlanta or, or San Diego or Providence, right? Um, it's rather, 
know, data becomes a kind of evidentiary currency that a community or an organizer can use in order to make a request from the city. And I think that's where that, that um, kind of struggle comes in. It's, it's oftentimes a quieter struggle. Um, and it's a it's a more drawn out struggle. Um, so I'd like to to jump in here too. I think it kind of um, um, builds off kind of that concept of emergent and emergent strategy as well. Um, and I know you're largely focusing on, or the audience is more potentially for designers, and you're focusing on design and democracy. Um, but you do situate it, you know, in the academy. And I I'd love to kind of ask a question about you know, the role of academy in your work or the role of um, academics in these sort of design experiments in civics. Because even though you, you sort of root the work in pragmatism throughout the book, I kind of get the sense too that you sort of um, position academics as sort of being able to, or, you know, potentially having the privilege or responsibility to kind of make space for imaginative leaps outside of the purely pragmatic or, you know, what's considered pragmatic or practical in, the kind of compromised or um, um, you know, compressed context of, of government or um, you know, industry market logics and all of that. So you know, this shows up a lot in my own work in the smart city where mm -hmm. so much of the administrative action was really sort of motivated by and large by the condition of resource constraints. And, and I think that's in Lily's work as well where sort of innovation culture and entrepreneurship are sort of naturalized because of other constraints like um, state welfare or attraction. But yeah, I'd love to hear more about sort of the, the role or responsibility as you see it of those in the academy to kind of do and support that like reflective and imaginative, like imaginative labor. Sure, so um, I, I, I think I would agree entirely with that word responsibility. So, um, and, and this may almost sound um, romantic, but I'm okay with that. I, I think that that's part of the responsibility of academics is to ask questions and pursue courses of inquiry and, and action um, that don't make sense um, in other settings. Whether those settings are the settings of government or the settings of industry, right? Like I actually think we have a responsibility to ask questions that otherwise seem ridiculous um, or imaginative or, um, and, and, and I saw this time and again. So folks from the city would say, we're never going to be able to implement this because we're actually putting out these fires, right? Sometimes literally, right? Like, that's fine. Um, but we shouldn't limit our, our vision of what democracy is to what someone in the city government has to do on a Wednesday at three o'clock, right? Um, or, or I think more often, we shouldn't limit our imagination or, and our pursuit of what um, democracy should be in our cities based upon the fine print in a contract that's signed with a technology provider that's putting in smart light posts, right? Um, and 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 similarly, you know, I think the the so it wasn't just that that folks in industry are saying like, well, this isn't quite aligned. Um, and I really hold that to to be true. And again, I don't think it has to be that doesn't have to be antagonistic, right? Like if I like let's if I wanted to work, I think if any of us wanted to work at a um, design consultancy, we could. And the things, but I think the things, for example, that um, I can do things that my colleagues at IDEO can't do, right? Because I'm not a multinational global corporation that has to worry about um, paying salaries and um, being profitable, right? And so I actually think it's my responsibility to say, what's the work as an academic? that doesn't make sense for the design consultancy to do. It doesn't make sense for the, um, uh, the program director in city government to do. That to me is what I, at least as an academic, um, am motivated to do. And I think, I think it's actually an important space to keep open in order to keep our democracy vibrant. Carl, can I jump in on that? Because I think I mean, I, I, I love that statement, but there's also, um, there are a series of pragmatics. This may be an overly practical question. There are a series of pragmatics that shape your own institutional context. And one that's, you know, always jumps out for me in some of these projects is the temporalities by which we as academics can engage in, in 
research or programs of inquiry. And particularly for, for our students, you know, so frequently those projects do not play out at the, on the, on the convenient timescale of the length of a PhD, right? Or the length of an NSF project. And I'm just sort mm -hmm. of like, there are ways around some of those things. I'm just kind of, and clearly the work that you describe in the book encompasses many different engagements and many, the work of many different students and many different projects. And so I'm just intrigued as to how, you know, those questions of mismatched temporalities have arisen for you and how you have worked yourself, worked your way around them. Yeah. Um, Actually, could I, sorry, could I just piggyback there too? Like, I just, um, I think it's related to Paul's question, but I feel like, um, you know, I really appreciated your focus on you know, democracy in the small and sort of like the immediate or the local. Um, but it seemed to me like the time scales of these projects were really quite expansive. And I was definitely curious to hear more about, yeah, how time and temporality played into sort of these commitments to democracy. Right, sure. Um, I'm gonna try to answer that in a way that's really concrete. And then if we want to get less concrete, we can too. So, um, one of the ways, so you're right, um, this, this work, uh, like there wasn't one NSF grant, right, for this project. Right? Um, in fact, there was a, several of the projects that never had any funding at all. Um, and some of the projects that had, we will take some NSF funding from, and some of the projects, at least one that, and, and I note this in the book, that actually had industry funding, right? So I think it becomes this interesting way of thinking about what can we do with industry funding as academics. Um, you know, the challenge of doing this with students is, is hard. And so if you, if I really break this down, you know, if I look at, at projects that happened, let's say when we were working with the urban foraging collective, right? There were specific things that needed to get built, right? Like a map needed to get built. And that actually did fit into um, the arc of an undergrad um, who wanted to build something over the course of um, two years, right? Three years. Um, there were sensors, right, that needed to get built and prototyped. And that did fit into the arc in one case of a master's student, another case of a PhD student um, in their time. And so as academics, I think, and, and, and in particular as, as faculty, it becomes about stepping back and saying like, okay, can I, can I look at this project over the span of five years or 10 years um, and then begin to see the ways in which um, different people can come into this project, where then my role and responsibility is to provide that continuity, um, um, both to the partners, but then also um, with the students as well. And so it really is like, and there are times, right? So in, 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 in one of the projects, the Careful Coding Project, um, a couple of students worked on that, um, but by and large, it was myself and a research scientist because that project was, um, a beautiful mess, right? And I say that because like it was constantly changing, right? As the city was changing its databases, as the city was changing, what counted as a code violation? You know, the, um, the, the Super Bowl came to town in the midst of all of that. And so suddenly the city changed its priorities about which neighborhoods it wanted to clean up. Um, we had to make the decision that that actually wasn't appropriate for um, a master's student or a PhD to be working on, like it just wasn't gonna fit. And so that became something um, that was more directed by myself and my colleague, um, Amanda May. Um, so I think that, um, that that is a constant negotiation of figuring out how this fits in with students. It's also, I mean, I think many of us are in similar sorts of fields, whether you're in the design field or HCI field or um, informatics or communication, right? Um, a lot of these students are going on to professional practice and a lot of these students want to produce portfolios that help them get jobs, right? And, and that we need to respect that, right? Those students are paying a lot of money to come to our institutions and they're trusting us. And so part of the conversation also becomes, okay, in the midst of this beautiful mess, um, what can we do um, that becomes a project that is legible to you as a master's student and where you want to go next. So I see that as part of my responsibility. Um, and then, yeah, I also in terms of the temporality and the local, you know, um, we've been in Atlanta for 15 years um, and uh, 
you, you, you build up relationships over time. Most of these projects were started after, I mean, the earliest one was started after I had been here five years, right? But some of them later than that. Um, and, and that, that kind of longstanding being in place um, provides the opportunity to do a certain kind of work, right? I don't think that this book would have manifested um, if I had moved every five years. Can I jump on that? Because I think there's this, um, I mean, I think that question of, you know, how do you organize the temporalities, like that's really helpful. And like, that's something that I'm trying to learn here at UCSD. I think it was at a moment where, um, you talked about like the students kind of needing to do projects to get degrees, which like kind of provoked a feeling in me because I had just read Roderick's question in the chat. Um, if it's all right, I'll read it. Yeah, please do it. It's a great question. Recording. Great question. Yeah. Um, so Roderick writes, really wonderful work, Carl. Um, design for small D democracy, i.e. communal life is such a wonderful approach. It speaks of care and selflessness, but caregiving turns so easily to exploitation. Where does the labor come from for the kinds of design work you've been doing and studying for the last decade? I think about it, the neighborhood people. I think a lot about the neighborhood people who devote themselves to collective projects but don't have health insurance. Um, yeah. How do like how do you work through that? How is that a way you understand that changed over time? Um, this is something that like social movements, like nonprofits, like uh, you know, have dealt with a lot. There's that nonprofit. Uh, the revolution will not be funded book that's like kind of in the intro chapter the funded versus the unfunded people who are involved in a change effort yeah so in no way i'm going to make the claim that it was entirely equitable right um i will tell you what we have tried to do um for example with the data collection that happens in um with our neighborhood partners um they are paid and they are paid in different ways um, sometimes they are paid um, through us getting a grant, for example, at the university level, right? So there's university, I mean, all of our universities have this, here's a seed grant, and we say, okay, we're going to get the seed grant, and we're going to take X number of dollars, and we're going to actually um, put those dollars towards our community partners, um, and then they're able to get um, paid for that. So whenever possible, I think our focus is to try to pay people directly for their time. Um, in other cases, we've actually been able to hire them. So at least in two projects, we were able to hire um, people from the community organizations as temporary workers at Georgia Tech, right? Um, so they were working on projects and they had a three month contract or a six month contract um, that might've only been 10 hours a week, um, but for which they were getting um, paid. And it's a huge issue, um, and, and I would agree, we can't, I think we can't do this work, um, particularly you can't do this work if you want to do it in a sustained way that's going to last uh, multiple years without finding ways of actually compensating those partners that we're working with. Um, is that compensation equal? Um, without a doubt, the answer is no. I will say, and I, we, we can talk about this later if you want, like this is actually one of the sparks for um, a more recent project that my partner and I are doing, where we're actually trying to start a job training program, which looks at how do you actually redistribute the resources of the university through something like job training, where you're able to bring people in to do civic data work, um, and they're, they're actually getting paid a livable wage with benefits in Atlanta. Um, so I think this is, that conundrum um, has sparked some ideas about how to move forward with this. Um, and, and yeah, I, 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 we, I'd be happy to talk more about that. Super helpful. I have something that's not quite a question, but maybe ties into some of this as well. Um, it wasn't, you know, sort of a, a separate section or, or um, chapter, but you know, I think you do really attend to um, affect effectively throughout the text. Um, and I know you sort of, you cite Murphy and Toronto to kind of caution against, um, you know, forms of care as sort of an add-on or, or feel good paternalism. Um, but I, you know, I, I feel like you, what you do really effectively show here and what's kind of even coming up in this particular question and conversation is that 
you know, <laughs> trying to care in the academy and in design um, doesn't necessarily feel very good. Um, you know, it's quite fraught um, because of all the tenuousness and awkwardness and, and sort of productive ambivalence, especially when you are sort of committed to working against sort of entrenched power systems that you're sort of aware are not likely to be disrupted. Um, so yeah, again, it's not much of a question, but I'd love to hear more about sort of um, how affect was showing up, you know, in the design encounters. And um, that was just something that really resonated with me. Yeah, I really appreciate that because to me, a a affect is a big part of this book and a big part of this work. And, and I think big part of the challenge, again, you know, how do we write these stories about design that, that aren't about um, the champion, right? Like we all, like, or, or aren't about the hero. And, um, but that really recognize this work as, as being fraught and, and the work is fraught, right? I mean, uh, um, when you work with a community that's facing gentrification, it, history tells us exactly what's gonna happen here. Um, and, and that is, um, I mean, you're working with people who are losing, right? Um, what is um, important to them, and 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 that many of us don't, um, not all, right? But many of us don't um, often fear losing things like our homes, like that. Um, and so, yeah, these are not feel-good moments, and I think that that's a really important thing to draw out and to accept and to be in that space to say, if we want to do this work, it is. Um, we're not gonna necessarily feel great about what happened at the end. And yet that doesn't mean not to do it, right? I, I mean, I think that's one of the things I'm trying to, to say is like, yes, you should do this and you should be aware that a lot of times things aren't going to change, right? Or they change and then they change back and you just need to continue on with this. Um, for me, this like really, uh, and I think there's other folks who are um, having these discussions as well about, you know, what, what are the affects that, that tend to undergird a lot of the work that we do in design or technology um, or innovation? Um, and how do, we, how do we come to accept a broader range of, of feelings around this? Um, so. Kind of related to that. I mean, I, I would love to know more about, um, you know, so when you were talking about the, um, kind of the smart cities design charrettes you talked about you told this very like vulnerable and like real story about you know you're showing like you have one of the charrettes a bunch of planners show up it's in like a gentrifying corner of the city the next time you have the charrette it's in a neighborhood that's not you know farther away from both like the smart city system and the um the gentrifying parts of the neighborhood and uh your collaborator is Miss, a woman named Mrs. P mm -hmm. and um, you're like waiting for the event to start and like people aren't coming mm -hmm. <laughs> right about this, which is amazing. <laughs> um, and then Mrs. P ca calls people up and people start coming in because of like, they know her or like they're mm -hmm. engaged in something. They have something at stake in their relationship to Miss, Mrs. P mm -hmm. um, or like similarly, like this coding, caring coding project where um, you were, your, your team was helping do um, data collection with Les, Les is like trying to file these like tactical code enforcement claims, right? And like you talk about how Les is like, uh, Les is not gonna submit all the code enforcement claims. He's not there to like call the cops on everybody. Right. Uh, you know, he, like, what was, like what were Mrs. P trying to do and change? What was Les trying to do and change? Like how were they using you in their plans, I guess, was a question. That yeah, I and I, I, that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. And, and um, in both cases, um, and actually in almost all the cases described in the book, there's ways in which um, we as academics are, are being used in, in ways that I think are actually really um, productive. So, um, uh, with Ms. P, we were involved in another project that had to do with uh, land trusts, housing land trusts um, in Atlanta, and, and we had worked with her um, for multiple years, right? And I think that, you know, so the topic of the smart city was actually not something that she was interested in. Um, we had done a lot of data collection and a lot of mapping around um, properties that could be available for this land trust they were starting. But I think that she saw this as a as an opportunity to say, um, 
you know, to, to try to bring folks to participate in this workshop that she saw us wanting to do. And so um, in that way, I think that she's, I mean, bluntly, I think that she thought like, okay, I'm gonna do them this favor, right? I'm gonna do them this favor, right? Um, and, and it was pretty open in that. And we had a very open relationship like that. Um, you know, I think with, with, with Les, um, he was very clear, he still is very clear. Uh, I don't remember all the pictures that are in the book, but you know, when we would go and collect data, Les has this GT hat that he wears, right? Like a GT baseball cap, right? Um, or a GT t-shirt, right? Um, and for him, he is very much, he's aware that he is leveraging a certain set of authorities um, um, when we deal with the city. Now he's also very much aware that there's certain times he doesn't want to leverage that because for good reason, right? GT has a not great reputation um, with community organizations, right? So Les isn't gonna wear that hat um, um, some places, but he is gonna wear it other places. And it was a very open, still is a very open conversation with about like, at what point um, do our partners want to leverage um, Georgia Tech? Um, and its institutional authority, and at what points do they want to um, be distanced from it? Actually, like with that, with the land trust project, that's really interesting because one one thing that I struggle with in um, you know being academics is like, well, we're academics often, you know, in this political economy that privileges STEM research for national competitiveness. Okay, yeah, Congress is like tweaking the. Diff funding mm -hmm. law so now it might have some other values too and um you know in this in the book a lot of the examples are um i think unless i'm mis i think all the examples are they are tech and computation examples and you're open about using you know getting nsf funding for these projects too and so like what what do we do like how do we like take seriously the fact that the land trust is like as or more important as the computation, mm -hmm. um, being academic workers in the university, like, do we just, you know, like, do we, do we, like, yeah, how do we write, that? how do you think about that, I guess? Um, Sorry to drop it on you, anybody can answer No, I, I think that, the, I think it's a great question. I mean, um, so I guess there's a couple strategies. I mean, one is, um, again, I think this is the thing that we, we can do as academics is that we're not bound to a specific topic, right? Like, like the, the, the three of you that I can see on my screen, right? Like even uh, Leah, who I've known for the least amount of time, right? Like our topics change, right? And so we can move um, in and out of topics. Um, and then I think it becomes a tactic about like, okay, how do you abstract this out? And so while the work was fundamentally about land trusts, you know, we ended up, um, what we could do is we could say, okay, well, we can actually help with um, mapping technologies because that's one of the things that they wanted to do was to create these sort of maps of available homes um, that could be purchased as part of the land trust. Um, and then, and yeah, this actually isn't, this is another project. And, and then we actually helped them create a model because the, um, the stadium was going into that neighborhood about if different kinds of tax incentives were offered, like how many homes could be purchased into the land trust. Right? Uh, and so it became a way to say like, okay, we're interested in supporting the land trust. Um, and we're interested in supporting this particular community member who we've worked with. And so what are the capacities that we can bring? And, and to me, this is, this is, again, I think what's it's kind of interesting as a design approach, right? It's like, okay, what? Are, it's not that, okay, I'm gonna always lead with this or that, but what are the capacities I can bring um, in this situation? So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Others, please throw in. Yeah, uh, I just, I got, yeah. sorry, I got distracted with too many windows. Um, I will, take this moment to remind the audience that you can add something to the chat or to the Q&A and we'll try and sort of feed it in. Um, oh, there's one. Um, so, but I do want to go back to some of that conversation and a couple of things. One is you made this very nice point when I raised some of those um, practicality questions earlier, which I, you know, you talked about that as partly as like, 
helping students recognize what a doable problem is within the sort of broader engagement. Um, but that question is, at least in the way that Lily phrased it, is an interesting challenge to those kinds of things as well, because it's about where things have, there are practical problems, but there, there are not necessarily academic problems, not necessarily mm -hmm. scholarly problems on the same level. But, you know, part of the broader commitment is to work towards those things, work towards those kinds of goals. Um, and so, so there's, but there's challenges in bringing students along. I would not be fulfilling, fulfilling my responsibility to the community partners, but not necessarily fulfilling, fulfilling my responsibility to my students if I, if I take us off down this thing where I don't think there's necessarily. Now, of course, one of the great secrets that we don't tell the students is there's a doable problem in everything. <laughs> so, so I often I don't like to admit that. that. But it's also, but it's also reminded me of this other thing that we were talking about a little bit before we before we started. That for me is such a powerful moment in the book, which is that moment, which is you know around the at some point you're going to have to decide whose side you're on. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it'd be nice if you could tell that story just quickly for people who haven't had the benefit of reading the book. But we can also talk about the fact that there are, you know, the, the, the overlapping responsibility that we have to many different constituencies and, and groups that we participate in, in, in working through these kinds of projects. But the students are one of those constituencies. There's my relationship to the institution, there's my relationship with the community partners, but there's also the students whom I am bringing with me in order to achieve their own ends. But maybe I'll just let you tell that story quickly. Sure, so the, the story quickly is that we were out collecting data and by we, it was myself and Les and a grad student and a code enforcement officer. And at one point, um, the code enforcement officer, um, we were collecting data about um, decrepit houses that had been left to sort of rot by absentee delinqu and delinquent landlords. And at one point, the code enforcement officer said, you know, you're going to collect this data and what's going to happen is it's going to turn out that you're reporting a house that belongs to someone who's quite senior um, and actually use the I, an example of the president of the university. And then that person's going to complain to me and they're going to say, why did you cite this house that belongs to my aunt? And I'm going to say, because Carl gave me this data. And, and at that moment, you're going to have to make this decision. Like, are you there to support the community members or are you there to do the work of the university? And it really was like, I mean, talk about an agonistic moment. Like, I think what was great about that is like um, the code enforcement officer brought with full force that moment of contestation and questioning um, and really demanded a commitment that I think to me is, is um, central to a lot of this work. And so, yeah, then the question is, is like, how do we make these commitments and what's the right commitment for me to make as a faculty member versus the commitment that a student might make? Um, and, and, and where do those commitments show up? So let me try and bring in a question from Akshita that got asked in the Q&A. Um, so as you're working through participatory democracy, can you say more about the dependencies that emerge within communal experience that might inform how design could move away from both just merely reproducing capitalism, but also that of individualism. Yeah. Um, it's such a great question, right? Because, because so much of design is predicated on this idea of individualism. So much of design education um, is still predicated on that. I, I, I think that the, um, you know, I think for me, this, this comes with, with becoming, with working closely with organizations over time. Um, and in that temporality, you begin to see when you work with a community organization, um, how much people go in and out of these organizations and that it's not really about what any one person is doing in this year or that year, but what this organization is striving to achieve over the span of five years or uh, a decade or longer. And so I think that there's an important part of doing this kind of work that's really about um, learning other ways of being in the world and learning about other ways of making together um, that, that does go against a lot of what we are commonly taught. Um, uh, I see the question about the event. Do you want me to tackle that one too? Yeah, please. Yeah, so the question is basically, what's the, what, you know, what's the value of the event? And I think that the value of the event is that it, it does bring this question of, um, one, it brings this question of temporality into it. 
Two, it, it has us look at and say like, okay, if we think about this experiment as an event, what's the work of designing? And what I end up arguing is that the work of designing becomes this idea of gathering and orchestration, right? And so we're, we're the event, in order to have the event happen, like we have to gather um, or work together with others to gather people um, and things other than people um, into a space. Right? And then we have to sort of orchestrate the kind of interactions. And so the event allows us to look at something. And, and again, from my perspective of wanting to have parts of this book that would be relevant to folks who either do design or study design, say like, aha, here's this made thing that we can conceptualize this as. And then we can understand what are the qualities of that made thing. And for me, the event gives us the kind of qualities that has a temporality. It has this um, characteristic of bringing people um, together, and then it has actually a set of um, affects that we experience with it. There's something I wanted to ask, and it's like, it was sparked by a quote, something I read yesterday, which unfor I, unfortunately at the time I didn't write it, that, write down the source, and it turns out to be an ungoogleable phrase. It's one of those ones that's all based on, um, on very simple words, but it was like, the phrase was, hope doesn't spark action, action sparks hope. And it's particularly like towards right at the end of the book, you sort of frame some of your discussion in terms of hope. And it made me wonder whether we should read this as a diag read the whole you know, book here as a diagnosis of contemporary design or a diagnosis of contemporary democracy. You know, should we see the sort of small scale participatory local democracy that you're sort of talking about as a pragmatic matter for you, you know, what you as a designer can like reach out and get hold of, or should we read it more broadly as, as an argument about um, things that we're sort of forgetting when we think about big D democracy right, versus small D democracy? I mean, I'd love it if people read it as both, right? So Johan Redstrom has this thing when he talks about design theory, that whenever you do design theory, you're doing theory about design and something else, right? Because design is this applied thing that, that never exists on its own, right? It always exists in relationship to something else. So that when we're doing design theory, it is this idea of design that we're experiment, exploring. And then I would hope also this idea of democracy, because there is a sense in which I, mean, I think we have to admit, like, you know, wh whether you're in, a, in, in Georgia or, or wherever you are, right, um, um, like the future for democracy is not clear, right? And, and so we need to begin to, I think, to consider other ways that we can go about these democratic pursuits and, and, and maybe these small scale um, activities are one way to do that. And just kind of thinking through what you just said, um, I read a book recently called Uber versus Taxis by Juan Del Nido, but what the book's actually about is, you know, how people, how especially middle class people responded when Uber came to Buenos Aires, like breaking all the laws and like the, ta and how they, those middle class people responded to union taxi drivers, like accessing their institutional rights, taking direct action. There's this like sense of like, no, like middle class common sense things just need to be convenient, like get off of my road and like get out of get off my lawn kind of thing. So in that sense, I feel like, um, you know, paying attention to democracy in the small and um, dealing with, you know, kind of like pointing out the kinds of um, the, the discomforts that come with forming alliances uh, across the kinds of strata of society that capitalism would like to maintain uh, it seem like an important seem like important to pay attention to and like grow from yeah i guess you know what i'm really influenced by the work of jk gibson graham right who are um um, feminist economic geographers. And I think one of the things that Gibson Graham do that, that has moved me for a while is they say, look, you, you could examine, um, you, you could examine all, all of these things, right? Um, that are threats to our lives, right? And, and all of these things that end up being like the worst aspects of free market capitalism, and you could critique them, right? And 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 and, and I think that they would say, and they do say, and, and one should do that, right? At the same time, it's also valuable work to look and say, what are all these other ways of being, right? And so that's what Gibson Graham do. They give us all these other different ways of understanding. Here's different ways we can think about markets. Here's different ways we can think about labor. Here's different ways we can think about change. And they open up um, 
they open up this field of possibilities. And I think that that's really what I'm interested in when it comes to design. It's not like, like the book isn't actually an anti-capitalist book, right? Like the book is just like, let's just think about democracy in a different set of words than we're used to thinking about everything else in design, right? Because what we, when we do that, um, we can then suddenly see these possibilities in different ways. And, and I think that to me is, is what I'm hoping um, this sort of helps us step towards. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say like, you know, the um, JK Gibson Graham are, you know, beautiful and important economic thinkers that I've learned a lot from too. There's kind of like a response to JK Gibson Graham from, you know, South Asian political economist, Kellyanne Sanyal, and his argument is that, well, a lot of the kind of alternative economic practices that Gibson Graham are talking about in some cases are people who've been dispossessed and are moving to cities and are like living in these informal economies as a means of survival. Um, and so, you know, how, how do we how do we appreciate that while also not like romanticizing um, that survival and that those alternative ways of practice? Like, you know, like I think that's where I asked the first question about conflict and struggle too. Was like sometimes I feel like, you know, like with the smart street lights in San Diego, okay, like here's another encroachment that's going to deepen criminalization, that's going to like put, you know, make more evidence for more police to put people in cages and like um, dismantling, like, you know, what, what does a democracy in the small look like when we're also set, setting about to dismantle something? And like, how does that channel, channel, challenge designers to new forms of kind of co to collaboration or Mm -hmm. themselves to other kinds of efforts. That's an interesting point because it is sort of like, I mean, I, you know, I agree with your, your, a lot of the things you're espousing in your democratic ideas, but I guess there is that danger that because systems like capitalism or democracy, you know, are so multiple and are so flexible, they can have this, this um, process of, of absorbing otherwise. And I think this is something, I, you know, I think my commitments lie more in sort of like an abolitionist theory of change, but it does become really difficult, which is why I appreciated your emphasis on imagination to sort of Im imaginatively leap outside of, you know, what currently is. But yeah, I think, I guess I don't really have a comment in there, but I'm, I'm just thinking with you all, um, but these, these are things that, that have come up for me as well. Is that oh, to like that as well? <laughs> I don't know if Paul, we have time to read the first question. Um, Cause it seems like it dovetails really nicely with- Oh what? yeah is right now sure we'll do that and then then i think we'll have to wind it up um so yeah the first question from veronica uh, i was wondering about the framework of democracy and its particular history with capitalism the book does a great job unpacking these two concepts but i don't know if you have ideas on how democracy changes become becomes better i guess if we take capitalism out um I, I do have ideas about that. Um, I, I think that definitely democracy would change if it take capitalism, particularly as we know it today, out. I also think it's important, like Mackenzie Wark has this um, statement that like we're actually no longer in capitalism. What, what we're in is something else, right? And, and maybe that's also worth recognizing. Um, I believe it's something worse. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so I, I don't think that, um, I think the free market capitalism as we are currently in the midst of it at least in the states, I'll just um, is detrimental to democracy without a doubt, right? And I, I would stand by that claim, and um, we could talk all afternoon um, about that. So, um, and 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 I think that it, you, you know, at the end of the day, um, it, it comes down to this idea that we're in this moment where it's all about competition, it's all about uh, the individual, and I think that those ideas are are not um, beneficial towards um, democracy, while also recognizing, as Lily points out, like, and, and in the discussion about alternative economies, yes, we have to be, and, and Leah points out, like, we have to be careful not to romanticize this, right? We have to be careful not to say, um, you know, farmers' markets are going to feed the world because they probably aren't, right? Um, and and so we we need to, um, or or also to say that 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 these other modes of whether it's whether it's social organization or economic organization are themselves often rife with um, oppression, right? So it's it's not as if local politics are oppression free <laughs> at all. Um, uh, so I, I wanna be clear about that. 
I had a great quote in the book about Iris Young's critique of the word community as flattening yeah. power and difference. Um, that was, I really valued that. Mm -hmm. So I want to hold to my statement earlier that Zoom meetings that go on for longer than an hour are cruel and unusual. <laughs> Um, and so, so I said I was going to be fairly brutal about our timekeeping, and I've got one eye on the clock since I think we are now through our hour, despite the fact that the conversation is, is you know, is is lovely. But as Carlos pointed out, it could go on for for months. If I if I if I mm -hmm. that's I'm sorry, I'm now just contemplating a months long Zoom call. <laughs> just, oh, no. It's not fair <laughs> thinking about. It. No. Um, so, so the particularly unpleasant thing about winding any of these up is that the one thing that we have no way of adequately reproducing on Zoom is the, an audience appreciation for the for the contributions of um, of of our panelists and Carl. So it's down to me then simply to say thank you so much. This has been a really fabulous conversation. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, there's, as Carl points out, many more conversations to be had and hopefully we will get to have them not only by Zoom but in person and over drinks um, for years to come. Um, yeah. So thank you Carl so much for the book and the occasion for having this conversation. Thank you to uh, Lily and Leah for rising to that occasion and um, enriching our conversation so much. Thank you to um, all the attendees uh, for being here and for contributing your questions, at least those we got to. Apologize, apologies to Rajesh, whose question we did not, but again, I'm being brutal about timing. Um, so thanks to everybody. Thank you all for being here. There